we are just a fortnight away from a result in the referendum to change Australia's constitution. And while the polls are encouraging for the no side of the campaign, there's still considerable risk to their success. Turnout is a real risk. You know, the idea that busy, stressed Australians who are grappling with their own issues with the cost of living and housing might think their vote doesn't matter. It will be vital to combat the perception that this is a done deal for the no side, because it isn't. There's a long way to go. Meanwhile, this week, Anthony Albanese started framing a narrative for the survival of his leadership in the event that the referendum on which he has staked it all fails. And he put it this way. I do think that there will be, from this point on, there will be more of a focus on Indigenous disadvantage. I think that the awareness and consciousness of Indigenous affairs has been raised to the point uh, whereby, uh, you know, you'll never again have, I don't believe, a situation where you, you won't have uh, Indigenous affairs uh, raised uh, on the floor of the parliament. And for a long period of time, you know, it wasn't front and centre of issues. So in short, he regards it as fine that he spent $364 million of your money and tens of millions of campaign dollars because now we all talk about Indigenous Australia. What a load of nonsense. First, imagine what those dollars could have done for people in our community, Indigenous and not, who are doing it tough. Second, this is a nation already heavily engaged in genuine concern for Indigenous Australia. To say anything else is to ignore the fact that the impact on Indigenous Australians is a matter deliberately and specifically considered in every bill that the Parliament considers already. It is to ignore the fact that there are more consultation bodies, more requirements to gain Indigenous consent for projects, more native title holders with direct property rights and more advocacy groups for Indigenous issues than at any point in our history. To say anything else is to ignore the fact that 30.3 billion taxpayer dollars a year is spent just on making life better for our Indigenous Australians. To say anything else is to ignore the fact that the taxpayer already spends more than twice as much a year on an Indigenous Australian as it does on a non-Indigenous Australian. The most recent Productivity Commission report into Indigenous expenditure shows that in 2015 to 16, total expenditure per person was $44,886 for Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander Australians. That compares with $22,356 for other Australians, a ratio of over two to one. Now, that's based on some relatively dated figures, so it's likely to be an even bigger difference now. There's 983,700 Indigenous Australians in this country, according to the last census. That's up 23% from the last census, an increase that massively outstrips the birth rate. Most live in urban areas and don't have life outcomes that are much different from non-Indigenous people. But just 15.4% of that number, or to be more precise, 150,800 people live in remote and very remote places and are Indigenous. And these these are the people who are most disadvantaged at present. So when Mr Albanese says, well, at least these issues are on the agenda now, it is nothing but spin. Australians are good, decent people with genuine care for those who don't have decent access to services or reasonable living standards, whatever their colour and wherever they live. And it's shown by the remit and dedication of the National Indigenous Australians Agency, by the abundance of representative bodies 
and the massive taxpayer spend on this small but valued group of people. Now, is there room for improvement in the way that money is spent? Sure. But attention and consultation are already there in abundance. There's no evidence that what is needed to get this right is the permanent division of our country into two groups with different democratic rights allocated based only on their race. You know, today, two prominent academics from the Australian National University and the University of New South Wales have written in The Australian about their support for The Voice. And they've used the illustration of the effectiveness of the Australian strategy to combat AIDS as an analogy for what The Voice will do. One of the academics writing was intimately involved in that HIV AIDS policy response. And, you know, credit where it's due, that strategy has been largely successful. But the argument they make proves the opposite of the point that they are trying to convey. The HIV AIDS response was one that consulted well and allocated resources effectively, but it did so without permanently and divisively changing the constitution. It did it without putting people at risk of suffering from HIV or AIDS in a separate group of people in our nation with different democratic or other rights based on that risk. And really importantly, it educated and informed people so that they were able to understand that it is the individual behavioural choices made day by day by those people at risk that made all of the difference. But that's not what the group grievance and victimhood narrative that's being spun around Indigenous Australians will do. The approach that underpins the voice is one of intergenerational grievance, you know, one to be followed by treaty and the establishment of a permanent so-called truth-telling commission with the task of approaching our history in a revisionist way. And all that does is disempower Indigenous Australians telling them that they are permanently different, permanently less than, on the basis of the fact that some crummy things happened to their ancestors. Now, I don't deny that some things in our history aren't great, but some things should also be celebrated. History is a complex thing. But most people in this nation can cite some crummy things that happened to their ancestors. Let's face it, we're a nation of convicts, a nation of migrants fleeing conflict in Europe, Asia and elsewhere, a country of refugees and, yes, Indigenous Australians. Even the British were conquered, but I don't see a claim for reparations from the Norman Conquest on the table. But if we lean into victimhood, we doom ourselves to fail on an individual and on a macro level. But if we lean into our strengths, the opportunity that comes with every new day to make good choices, to build healthy habits, to learn, to improve and to rise above our humble beginnings, well, then we flourish. This isn't just politics. It's also psychology. The stories we tell ourselves become the reality that we live out. Perhaps division and victimhood, racism and disadvantage are the wrong story to tell a people that we want to help succeed. But one thing is for sure, Mr Albanese is absolutely wrong, categorically wrong, to suggest that Australians didn't care about our Indigenous brothers and sisters until now. Funny thing about this referendum, and it really is quite odd, is that the positive vision for this country is actually being provided by the no side of the case. Because a no vote is a rejection of division and it's a call for unity. The definition of reconciliation is to bring two people or groups together after an argument or disagreement. Well, no voters support reconciliation and they know we can't do it by permanently dividing Australians in our democracy. This isn't good. And worse still, there's been no real engagement from the yes side 
about any of these issues. There's been no provision of detail on how it would work, how it would make a difference. And in the absence of any of that, the only sensible alternative is to vote no.